Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud. What's in Sydney? We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Droolers in Hong Kong. The top stories this hour. Hot US inflation set to weigh on Asian markets as Wall Street traders sent stocks and bonds sliding. Ten-year yields topping 4.5% in a hawkish repricing of the Treasury curve. President Biden welcomes Japan's Prime Minister to the White House just as the DOJ reportedly begins investigating Nippon Steel's $14 billion bid for US steel. And a political blow for South Korea's president. Parliamentary elections weakening his position with three years left in his term. Let's get you straight to the Open. And of course, so much of today will be uh, ahead of the Open, I should say, percolating through uh, the implications from, again, another hotter than expected inflation print from the US. That repricing of Fed expectations of easing very much top of mind. Stocks here in Asia prime for some early declines, as you can see, right across the futures board there and in the middle of cash trading for New Zealand, already down by half a percent. We're seeing Australian stocks quite significantly lower there in the future session, eight tenths of one percent. Really, um, uh, mirroring the selling, the selling that we saw on Wall Street on Wednesday, we saw the S&P 500 falling 1%. Uh, the Nasdaq also seeing weakness there as well. So we are really watching in terms of uh, how quickly this passes through. We're seeing Chicago Nikkei futures down by about four-tenths of 1%. That March U.S. core consumer price index stripping up food and energy costs, uh, really increasing four-tenths of a percent, more than expectations. And in fact, Bell, not just more than expectations, but this idea that obviously it was more than expectations for the third straight month. Are we starting to see that kind of structural stickiness uh, take hold when it comes to these inflation prints? It does look like a down day passing through here in Asia. Yes, yeah, certainly looks like the bias, of course, we know is for the Fed to be staying on hold post these inflation numbers. But the real action came through yesterday or overnight in the bond space. And you can see here that move higher across the curve, led by the front end, of course, that more rate sensitive here. But a jump of more than 20 basis points intraday in the session. Uh, so you saw the, the two-year yield hitting 4.97%. You've got the benchmark 10-year note topping 4.5% for the first time since November. Certainly very much an unthinkable turn of events, really, given when we came into this year, 150 basis points of cuts were being priced in, and now we're pretty much shutting the door at least to any sort of rate hike by June. Let's change on, take a look at what's happening in futures so far. Again, U.S. stocks looking to, to ha perhaps see some more downside pressure in the intraday session. That's the open of futures you've just got there. Uh, otherwise, of course, keeping an eye still on oil, what's happening in that space. More sensitive, though, to, to geopolitical news, Heidi, instead. Uh, let's get some more bell when it comes to uh, what we're looking at in, at the implications of that inflation print, right? Our global economics correspondent, Ender Curran, joins us now. So, Ender, as Bell just mentioned, we're seeing some pretty significant repricing of Fed easing expectations. What was most kind of interesting to you in the fact that we have had now a third straight month of hotter than expected levels of inflation? I think it was the breadth of increases across the products that people buy in, you know, every day of the week, Heidi. So, yes, half of it was down to, the, to rent and transportation. Those are kind of uh, familiar culprits by now. But when you look into the details, the cost of getting your car fixed, the cost of car insurance, the cost of education, the cost of going to the doctor, the cost of elderly care, these are just some of the services that also prices increase. The pace of increase for food is, has slowed quite sharply. That's the one positive bright spot. Uh, obviously, food prices remain elevated, but the pace of increase has slowed. But it's all these other pockets of day-to-day -day living that's really st where inflation is really starting to sting down. And then, as you were mentioning there before we come on, that forced a dramatic repricing of the Fed rate cut story today. Only a few months ago, traders were betting that by now the Fed would have cut interest rates uh, at least in March and heading towards another cut in June. Really and truly, those expectations are out of the water now. People are saying it'll be the back half uh, of this year if they do cut at all. And then you have people like former US Treasury Secretary Larry Summers making the point that the next move could be a hike. So I think today's inflation numbers, given that it's a third month in a row beating expectations, certainly have put an end to the whole disinflation narrative here. Given, as Heidi was saying as well, these sorts of structural changes that are taking place, though, is 2% even a realistic target, or are we sort of just facing a new normal now of 3% instead? 
I think there's, economists will say to you, look, it's going to be really hard now to get it down from three to two. That would inflict a lot of pain in the economy. Interest rates are already so high. And there, is, there are parts of the economy that are shipping pain. But nonetheless, the, the mandate handed down by, by the law to the Fed is to get inflation back to 2%. That is their target. I mean, their own core readings Still perhaps not as bad as the numbers we got today. But nonetheless, though, inflation's not where it should be. And it's also coming, of course, in a critical election year. And we heard President Biden today coming out and making the point that he still expects uh, interest rates to come down before the year is out. But I think all told today, when you consider the breadth of the pace of increases in these numbers, it's a reminder of just how hard it is going to be to get inflation back down to 2%. You can argue 3% is the new 2%, but the law of the land says it remains where the anchor is, and that is that has not changed. All right, that was our global economics correspondent, Ender Curran, there. And let's get more on the US inflation print now. Bring in Vishnu Varathan, head of economics and strategy at Mizuho Bank, joining us from Singapore this morning. And Vishnu, what stood out to you most in this print? Well... I think, I mean, of course, uh, looking at the inflation print, uh, the, the, the headline was as much of a, a little bit of a surprise uh, and, and certainly on the hawkish side. But when we take a step back, uh, what really stands out is there does seem to be a little bit of uh, legs in, in how quickly this inflation can come through in, in key components like rents. And I think the Fed is still of the view that it will come down. Uh, and, and so what we want to do is we want to look at inflation in tandem with wages. And this is where I, I think we do see some encouraging signs, which is the fear of a wage price spiral continues to diminish despite the stickiness around inflation. And I think that would be more important for the Fed's response function uh, rather than the inflation print in and of itself. So the market response doesn't surprise us, but I don't think it is a, you know, it's, it's a war call to turn around the views on which way policy is headed. So which way do you think policy is headed then? Because as we've been discussing, it's been this really big repricing. Have you, have you shifted your expectations at all for what the Fed's going to be doing this year? No, I mean, that, that's a really good point. I mean, at this, at this uh, juncture, the, the Fed would be quite correct to say that they continue to be data dependent. But it doesn't distract from two key things. The first is uh, disinflation has come a long way. So there needs to be some recognition for the path taken so far, despite the bumpiness ahead. And all that the Fed is now required to do is to get enough comfort that it is not re-accelerating so that they can cut rates a little bit. Because given that uh, the Fed still does not, and, and to your point about where structural inflation is, uh, the Fed's uh, uh, allusion to neutral rates continues to be real rates at about 0.5%, uh, which is to say that the current uh, rates are still very restrictive. And so the Fed has got some scope to cut at the very least 50 basis points, arguably something above 100 basis points. Uh, and, and all that requires is not for the data to change anywhere from where it is. All it requires is for the Fed to be comfortable enough to say, look, our response function can now be less hawkish. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's where it's headed, which is why for this year, despite uh, the dynamic repricing in the market for fewer than the three rate cuts in the dot plot, I think we are now settling on two uh, if forward curves are to be believed. Uh, despite that, I, I think the Fed still has scope to do that three rate cuts. Uh, and if consumption uh, and, and consumer sentiments weaken substantially, which we cannot rule out, they can still do more. So that's something we want to keep our eyes on. Uh, and and I, I think the last point about this is the 12-month view of rates, I think, could still be sharply lower rather than sticky. Vish, how closely are you watching commodities prices? Obviously, we've seen the moves in oil and in gold higher despite higher yields as well. We've now got US intelligence uh, warning about a potential strike by Iran and its proxies on Israel. Do you think this is going to be a bigger component into the said stickiness of inflation? Heidi, you make a really good point. I mean, uh, for sure, at least oil uh, is going to be a real headache for policy because on one hand, it does... Uh, I think reignite uh, concerns about uh, reaccelerating inflation, and the trouble with oil is it's got a really long reach and it tends to perm permeate inflation more broadly very quickly. So that's uh, uh, that, that, that's that's really something that the Fed will watch very closely. But the default response to oil may not 
quite be to hike rates substantially for two reasons. One is, I think there's, uh, there's, there's enough of uh, uh, understanding that this is caused by geopolitics. So the flares in oil prices uh, do not reflect demand. In fact, uh, could, in, uh, could dampen demand uh, as, as we go ahead. Uh, so I think they are hoping that this works out on the supply side, which is one reason why uh, trying to pump a lot more is part of the U.S. plan. Uh, the other component, uh, which, which you pointed out, which is the gold, I think gold, uh, for, for gold, I think it's in a, in a very unique space where it is looking at the, the risks of um, dollar debasement rather than inflation as a standalone because real rates continue to be high, which shouldn't push gold uh, too much higher, particularly uh, you know, as, as, as uh, the, the, the chances of stickier rates remain in place. But the broader uh, metal sector perhaps is still clinging on to some of the hopes of uh, you know, uh, China coming out of the woods. And, and that adds to some inconvenience, but I don't think it distracts from the broader disinflation picture if we cast our horizons a bit wider, if we go back to mid-2021 to now. The larger disinflation story is still intact. Uh, it does get a little bit more fraught and bumpy, but I don't think we are at a conclusion where policy needs to stay high and perhaps go higher. That, that, that argument, I think, uh, would require very tail-risk events to take place. Do you find the narrative of a cyclical recovery in China being on foot now compelling, given the ongoing structural issues we know still exist? Um, so this is the stuff that my, my grim days are made up of, wondering whether one offsets the other. <laughs> and, and, our, and our quick take on that really, really is, I, I think China has got scope to pick up a little bit for two reasons. One is it's from a really soft base. And the other aspect of it is that there seems to be a greater convergence around uh, the stimulus required. But to your point, a lot of the structural headwinds remain in place. And the pickup that you see in China is going to be a lot more spotty. I think industrial sector will pick up very quickly. Uh, consumer sentiments and property might remain uh, somewhat more beaten down. So you're going to see a very uneven recovery, but the industrial pickup uh, is something that's in the interest of China for two reasons. One is it's part of the geo-economic place. It's crucial that they get it right. And the second part is I think Beijing also recognizes that's one way to create jobs. Uh, and, and the jobs market being lackluster is one of the structural issues uh, that China uh, is very cognizant about. I think we oh, got I'm a sorry, little and, bit and of positivity out of that. Line. Our bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I, I was waffling too much. But the bottom line on that is we still think, you know, 5% growth rates are still out of reach. We, we are looking at something, uh, you know, softer than the four and a half clip, uh, just because of the drag factors we, we, we mentioned will remain in place. Okay, you had to end it on a characteristic down point. Vish, uh, always great to have you though. Vish Nuvaratan, Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank. Still ahead, the South Korean President's Conservative Alliance suffering a major defeat in parliamentary elections. We get some analysis later this hour. But first, the US and Japan enlisting Amazon and NVIDIA to help fund a joint artificial intelligence research program. We'll get the details on the Japanese Prime Minister's Washington visit next. This is Bloomberg. season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. President Biden is hosting a state dinner at the White House for Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The guest list, including Apple CEO Tim Cook, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and JP Morgan boss Jamie Dimon. And earlier, the two leaders announced efforts to improve collaboration in tech and AI. Let's bring our East Asia government editor, John Herskovitz. And uh, John, just reading up on the theme, it's a celebration of spring expected to mirror this bilateral alliance. What else are we expecting from this state dinner? 
Well, I think the musical guest is Paul Simon. We're going to have a, a menu that I think celebrates the California roll. There will also be some uh, U.S. ribeye. And it's, it's always an interesting thing. I think this is the fifth state dinner that Biden has hosted. And the pomp and pageantry, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We'll have interesting guests. Um, the figure skater Christy Yamaguchi, Robert De Niro are also supposed to be there. And for a shameless ter uh, plug, I think this is also live on the Bloomberg Terminal. <laughs> well, certainly a very coveted inv <laughs> invitation, so if you can't make it, yes, you can watch it on the terminal instead. But uh, we've already seen a number of agreements coming out of this. It does seem that focus really on emerging technology, but what can we take away from what's been announced so far? I think the, what we've seen from the summit um, and the meeting is just like the huge amount, the expanse of the relationship between Japan and the U.S. There's some problematic details like the uh, Nippon Steel acquisition of U.S. Steel, which is causing some problems on for Biden uh, because it's in a swing state of Pennsylvania. There are labor issues involved. Um, there have been some difficulties with uh, U with liquefied natural gas, the uh, Biden administration stopped uh, new licenses from January. Japan is a big consumer. So you have these strains, but you also have um, things that are benefiting the two countries. The um, AI deal that you alluded to, um, there's a plan to make the Japanese the person, the first non-American to go to the moon. So you're seeing like um, yeah, friction and also points that are moving the relationship together and it really just underscores how broad and deep the relationship is between the US and Japan. We are also hearing that the Department of Justice has opened up an antitrust probe into the Nippon Steel takeover. Is there a sense that this might have been the elephant in the room? Was it mentioned at all? I Exactly. It, it's it's um, whether it's mentioned or not, it just hangs over everything, because this is uh, such a key issue in Pennsylvania, one of the swing states for the election. Uh, Nippon Steel is one of the flagship companies of Japan, and while Kishi has given assurances that there won't be any labor disruptions, this is uh, it's just a big element that's hanging over the summit. How much is actually addressed is another matter, but this covers so much in, in terms of the relationship between the two countries and really affects Biden heading into the presidential election. That was our East Asia government editor there, John Herskovitz, and some other stories we're tracking this morning. And the Philippine president, Ferdinand Mar Marcos Jr., says he's horrified to learn of a so-called gentleman's agreement between his predecessor, Rodrigo Duterte, and China. Duterte's former spokesman says the deal bars the Philippines from shipping construction materials to a military outpost in the South China Sea. Tensions with China are set to dominate Thursday's summit with the Philippines, Jap Japanese and American leaders. Chinese President Xi Jinping met with uh, former Taiwan President Ma Yingzhou in Beijing on Wednesday. The two leaders shook hands at the Great Hall of the People in a rare act of diplomatic engagements. In comments that appeared aimed at the US, Xi told Ma that external interference cannot stop the historical trend of national reunification. Ma is the first former Taiwan leader to visit the Chinese capital. And, Bell, we are getting some reaction, uh, some commentary coming through from uh, Japanese policymakers when it comes to uh, the moves that we've seen in the yen, right? This is the Vice uh, Minister of Finance for International Affairs, Mosato Kanda, speaking at the moment, saying that they will take appropriate steps on FX as needed. They're not ruling out any options regarding Forex. These recent moves that they've seen in FX are rapid, and policymakers are prepared to address any event. They're not judging based on specific levels but that excessive FX moves are bad for the economy. The yen, they're holding on to its gain as uh, kind of really reiterates not ruling out any options. We've seen, of course, the Japanese currency weakening now past 153 per dollar to that fresh 34-year low. Uh, that is the lowest since June 1990, as we've seen, of course, a, a third straight month where that US CPI print has come in hotter than expected. So that deepening of the yen drop prompting more commentary now, the, the, the jawboning that we're hearing from Japanese Japanese officials, they're not ruling out any options regarding uh, the FX side of things and uh, prepared to address any event, uh, not based on specific levels, but not ruling out any options available to them.
More to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Australia will begin marketing its first ever green bond issuance. About 4.6 billion US dollars worth of debt maturing in mid 2034. Paul Allen is here with the details. So, how do we make uh, of the timing of this? Um, it is a little bit unfortunate. I mean, typically green bonds would attract a premium or a greenium, as it's become known. Horrible word that, but um, it does make the funding a little bit cheaper. But that's becoming less and less of the case. And if we take a look at last quarter, there was $187 billion worth of green bond issuance. 40% of that came from sovereigns. Uh, we've had the yield on the Australian 10 year also climbing over the past year by about 90 basis points. So that a greenium is slowly starting to erode. So maybe Australia is a little bit later to the uh, green bond issuance party. Uh, also, Australia, as we know, has a bit of a reputation as being a laggard when it comes mm. to moving on a climate. But this was all announced towards the end of last year and now the marketing phase begins. So there's a roadshow starts today in Sydney, moves on to Melbourne and Brisbane, and then heads offshore to larger markets such as Japan, uh, Singapore and Europe. Yeah, and it comes in the backdrop of the Prime Minister Albanese about to announce new legislation to boost investment in green manufacturing technology. So how does that play into it as well? Yeah, we've got a bit of a sneak preview of the uh, Prime Minister's speech. It'll happen later on tonight. Uh, this is the Future Made in Australia Act, another clunky name. But the intention here is to compete uh, with the likes of the US Inflation Reduction Act when it comes to uh, boosting investment, creating green jobs and manufacturing, attracting more high-tech investment as well. Uh, now, the Prime Minister says he understands that you know, Australia obviously can't compete with the US dollar for dollar, but he views this as uh, more of a competition rather than an auction. And as you say, tied in with this green bond issuance, that's worth about $4.6 billion uh, for this first uh, set of notes. Uh, electricity generation obviously gets a lot of focus here. About uh, a third of Australia's emissions annually come from the power sector. We're very coal and gas heavy. So the green bonds, this announcement from the Prime Minister tonight, this aims to sort of speed up that transition, a greater focus on uh, wind, solar, hydro projects as well. And the goal is to get the electricity sector 82 per cent renewable uh, by 2030. So that's only six years away now, so it's a fairly aggressive target. All right, that was Bloomberg's Paul Allen there. Let's uh, take a look at some of the other corporate stories that we're tracking this morning. And TSMC's quarterly revenue grew at its fastest pace in more than a year, thanks to booming demand for AI chips. The company reported a 16% rise in sales to almost $19 billion in the first quarter. That was above average analyst estimates. The main chip maker to NVIDIA and Apple expects revenue to grow at least 20% this year. The global AI boom has also sent Taiwan's exports surging by the fastest pace in two years. Bloomberg's learned that ByteDance saw a roughly 60% jump in profit in 2023. Sources say the company's EBITDA grew to more than $40 billion from about $25 billion the year prior. That growth is way ahead of its Chinese online peers Tencent and Alibaba, which is a sign of the TikTok owner's resilience in the face of an economic downturn. Coming up, we hear from the Center for a New American Security about how the South Korean president's parliamentary defeat could impact the rest of his three-year term. This is Bloomberg. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol has suffered a major defeat in parliamentary elections that will leave him in a weakened position for the remaining three years of his term. Yoon's Conservative People Power Party bloc is poised to secure about 105 seats in the 300-seat parliament, down from 119 before the vote. Let's get some more analysis now with Doyoon Kim, who's an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, who joins us now from Seoul. Doyoon, really great to have you with us. So we were just talking a little bit earlier. Did the of extent of this loss surprise you at all? Well, I think, you know, we saw the exit polls and that was 
they were an early indicator of um, what we might expect. Um, you know, this certainly is a big loss for the ruling party and for President Yoon. Um, and the stakes are really high for him, especially because uh, the president's uh, top priority, his domestic agenda, has been to implement a liberal democratic agenda at home. And so um, it, he is expected to face uh, challenges going ahead on his domestic policies, but his foreign policies are not likely to change drastically. How does this play out in terms of his ability to govern and his ability to push through policy for the next three years? Well, certainly he will be constrained because the opposition holds um, a majority in the National Assembly, especially on his domestic policies. But again, on his foreign policies, you know, foreign policies generally do not require National Assembly approval. So we can expect the president to accelerate foreign policies like on North Korea or on strengthening relations of the alliance relationship with the United States or improving relations with Japan or even contributing more to global issues. So I think we can see him bulldoze through these issues because of his personal conviction and his personal style. Uh, but if there is a challenge, it could be that the entire focus, the entire country's focus is now going to be on the upcoming 2027 presidential election. Even his own party is going to be squarely focused on preparing for that. And so if the country is focused on the upcoming presidential election, then implementing his foreign policies will really depend on whether the bureaucrats, his bureaucrats, will implement them at the same level and fervor as they have been until now, especially if the National Assembly controlled by the opposition cuts budgets, or if the bureaucrats feel that the domestic political environment is unstable until 2027. So how does this impact then some of Yoon's signature or, or, or priority policies then, including the Value Up program? Sure. And so, you know, this, the, the opposition, you know, as I said before, they are going to want to constrain uh, Yoon's domestic agenda. They're going to um, want to either um, disapprove or not let many of his policies pass or even especially his laws uh, be implemented. And so in this sense, his domestic agenda really is up for a major challenge. One of the things that really stood out to me, at least, was the turnout, because it was estimated at around 67%, but it does seem that that's the highest, or it would be the highest in more than three decades. So what does that symbol or, or signal to you? Well, you know, the number itself might sound low, but if we put it into the context that it is the highest uh, record high that the country has seen, I think it shows that um, the people, the South Korean people are, are really, um, you know, out to, um, you know, it, it's a fight between both parties uh, and and different ideologies here in South Korea. And it's also reminiscent pretty much the neck and neck or, or, or the, the amount of energy that has been put into um, voting this year uh, is reminiscent of the past, the most recent presidential election when, you know, South Koreans on the left and the right both were saying they are fighting for their country's future and they're fighting for their country's democracy. And so I think it really does reflect um, the level of interest um, coming from the South Korean voters. And as you mentioned, this result not really likely to affect Yoon's main foreign policy initiatives, but that does include taking a tougher line on North Korea. I'm curious for your perspective on what China's doing, sending its highest level delegation to North Korea in nearly five years. Yeah, so I think, you know, we're clearly seeing um, a situation where China, North Korea, and, and even Russia, the, those three countries are trying to strengthen their relationships uh, because they see the United States, South Korea, and Japan strengthening theirs, and they see the United States um, improving and strengthening relations with other democratic and like-minded countries. And so, you know, it, this really does not fare well on, uh, for example, the most pressing issue here in Northeast Asia, which is, is, North, is North Korea's nuclear weapons program. and any type of policy to try to rein in that program or even try to stop uh, that program. And we're clearly seeing uh, China and Russia playing uh, a very fierce uh, geopolitical game with the United States or against the United States. And so they have not been upholding their obligations, for example, um, their obligations at the UN Security Council to uh, implement um, sanctions on North Korea's um, uh, 
on sectors in North Korea that are financing uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons program. And so I think we're going to see in, in the months and, you know, perhaps even years ahead, um, uh, you know, a more of a stalemate when it comes to North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons program, especially on, di on the diplomatic front. And it's going to be um, a tougher going ahead and more challenging to try to deal with that. And it's going to be one of the sort of tougher issues if we do see this trilateral summit between Japan, South Korea and China that's uh, reportedly supposed to take place at the end of May, right? Do you think if this summit goes ahead uh, that it will be fruitful? What would be the priorities on that agenda? Well, that really remains to be seen, and there's so many um, variables and, and caveats to that um, equation. You know, clearly, um, you know, as much as South Korea and Japan are um, strengthening their relationship, their alliance relationship with the United States and other democratic uh, countries, you know, the reality is is that they also need to uh, cooperate with China, especially on the economic fronts. And so, you know, it's really difficult to predict at this point, you know, how fruitful or how successful um, a potential uh, summit between um, the China, South Korea, and Japan will be, or even if it will actually even happen. I think um, there are big question marks as to whether or, you know, that summit will actually even happen. You and Kim, adjunct senior fellow at the C Center for a New American Security. Really great to have you with us. Coming up next, we take a deep dive into FX markets amid a growing risk of yen intervention by Japanese authorities. We have just heard from Japan's top uh, currency diplomat uh, over the past sort of 20 minutes or so talking about they're not ruling out any actions when it comes to these rapid moves in the yen as it moves past 1.53 in the previous session. This is Bloomberg. All right, take a look at the Japanese yen. Uh, far from triggering intervention, we actually saw that 152 level being crossed with no reaction. We've seen it cross 153 as well, pulling back 152.89 is where we're sitting. We have seen that uh, level kind of being held as we hear from uh, Masato Kanda. Of course, this is Japan's top currency diplomat uh, talking about uh, the fact that these excessive moves are bad for the economy. They're not judging based on specific levels, but they are prepared to address any event and will take a Appropriate steps on FX is needed. They are not ruling out uh, any of these moves. Kanda saying that the FX moves in the yen from the beginning of the year are significant. And uh, this is quite interesting that the benefits of the weak yen, which we have seen, of course, play out in equity markets for Japanese exporters, uh, are decreasing at these levels. Uh, Michael Wilson, who's our FX and rates reporter, joins us now for more. So where is the line in the sand? Yeah. It's a, it's a moving target at the moment. Um, you know, we pick these round numbers or these calendar levels, um, the old 151.97. Um, but to be fair, we loitered under there for so long. Um, the, the catalyst, which was the US CPI, um, you know, it wasn't. Um, and the fact that there were so many of those barriers had rolled off, uh, the price action, you know, it just uh, sliced through that level. Where it ends, um, you know, we got to that 153.24 last night, but, you know, that may not be the top. You've got um, a couple of other. Um, uh, existential factors like we've got China CPI now um, you know some people were, if, if they're dollar bulls um, they may not necessarily want to go and buy uh, dollars against uh, yuan so they'll express that uh, that view via dollar yen mm. uh, so you know if, if you see a weak print um, dollar yen might, might push up on that um, because there's like the, uh, the you know the, the yuan itself is uh, uh, copying um, a little bit of grief right now and um, it's fueling the broader dollar move higher. So, you know, we could pick a round number, we could say 155 and dollar yen, and that gives us a bit of breathing space, maybe to get to the weekend. But you've got a, a US PPI out, uh, uh, tonight following, you know, three um, monthly uh, beats in the CPI print. So um, the setup is there, for, you know, for um, dollar um, gains to continue. Um, and I don't think that, you know, you'd be, you know, if you're a, um, a Kushida, or you waiter and you're sitting back and you're watching. Um, I think they might be better served just to let this run, just for, just for the next, say, 12, just, uh, 24 hours. Um, you know, in terms of intervention, uh, Mr. Kishida right now is in uh, in the US, so it would, he's you know going to break bread with uh, Mr. Biden and go and sell his currency at the same time. So that seems like a bit of a stretch from a uh, you know just a, a intuitive you know uh, perspective. So um, you know. 
unless something was to um, really hyper extend the move, I think they might just sit there and just see how it plays out because you know the dollar yen at 153 does have a good reason to be there. Uh, and until this Fed repricing is, uh, you know, the, the, obviously you saw the move in the bond market and everything. So until this settles down and you see, um, you know, the Fed reprice, June's off the off the, off the ticker now. Um, you know, and it, now they move towards July. Is July going to survive? If July doesn't survive, you might see 154 uh, as a consequence of that. So you know, we're not over. We're not, we're not over any at any stage. We're probably just you know beginning the next chapter and moving the range higher. Yeah, and as you say, it is that dollar yuan dynamic that really plays as well into this story. There are calls from from some China watchers for Beijing to loosen its grip on the currency. That is something that would have some uh, pretty serious reverberations, it seems. Well, exactly. So um, we, you, we've been looking at that uh, 725 level um, uh, recently, and it just blew through there. Now we're above there. In fact, you know. The, the whole range, um, uh, the whole descent, um, the, the level has been about um, 7.22 and a little bit as the, the halfway point. We've been above there now for quite a, like, you know, for a few days, like uh, I think March 27, we've been above that halfway point in, in the upper end of the range. So I think that, um, you know, the PBOC can, can come out and, and um, and throw probably for the one of the better good money after bad because you know the fundamentals are there, you know their CPI is coming out shortly. Um, how do they compete with three uh, hot prints out of the states? Even if they have a solid print, they're still going to lag the performance of what's going on in the states. So fundamentally, um, the the underlying weakness of yuan, you know they've got their own domestic dilemma. Um, but I think um, BOJ and, and PBOC have probably got the same uh, wish list um, and that's just to you know, try and ride this one out and intervene as, as little as possible rather than um, you know, cause any um, greater grief. All right, great insights. That was our FX and rates reporter, Michael Wilson, there. And as Michael said, uh, investors are also watching out for the latest inflation readings from China that are due in the coming hours. Bloomberg Economics sees the CPI retreating in March from a holiday-driven bounce. China's investability was a key topic at financial, as financial executives gathered for Bloomberg's New Voices Hong Kong launch event. KKR and HSBC Asset Management sounded an optimistic note on China, even as global investors withdraw billions. So first of all, the context is that I, um, the global fund allocation to China hit like five-year low, right? So the room for further like sell-off is... Like significantly reduced, put it this way. And then I think the concerns of our investor um, where we talk to you, primarily like, um, relating to geopolitical events like US election, uh, the weak property like market in China, the long-term growth right, right, um, of, of China and all that. So um, at the same time, the big discount, valuation discount, right, to the global markets and the Asian market versus China, also explaining why the, the underweight like, situation for so long, right? But as we talked about, right, we see the sentiment has improved um, because of, um, for example, the cyclical growth like stabilization, and then we also see capex like expansion, meaning that actually the market is already out of the deflationary cycle. Mm. So. With that, we started, to, we started to see some regional active manager cutting back the underweight position in Hong Kong and mainland China, and then add back to, for example, the tech or the growth stock starting in February. Mm. So this is what we have been like, seeing. Having said that again, I think um, investor, we eventually, they still need to see the uh, earnings revision before we can see more sustainable like big inflow to the market. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I believe I, um, this will, um, will, will need some time, right, before um, the, 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 the key trends, right, uh, like moving back to China. Yeah. Kate, um, do you, how attractive is China, this market, to you now? I mean, obviously, you've been trying to tap into the, the wealth, and, and what's the way to capture that in China right now? So we, um, we have invested in China. We continue to invest in China. We do think that China is investable. Um, you know, if you talk uh, about some of the trends that Daisy's highlighted, um, you know, China has uh, come under pressure, obviously, in the real estate sector. Um, but if you think about the new economy, the green economy, the industrial automation, um, this comprises about 20% of the GDP growth, but it's, you know, 50, it's actually 50% of the growth. Um, and so, 
that sector is definitely of interest. Consumption upgrade, technology upgrade. So we're, we're a simple investor. We invest in retail pharmacy chains. We invest in hospitals. We invest in white liquor. We invest in pet food, mushrooms. You know, it's, it's the consumer that we are after. And if you think about 850 million odd of millennials, you know, these are the uh, consumers that we invest into. Um, now, I do want to add that renminbi as a currency, um, when you look at trade, um, has an increased transaction uh, you know, volume today. Uh, we see the renminbi currency as an, in, as an ecosystem in China, and we want to invest into that. Daisy, um, you mentioned a little bit more about you know, putting cash to work. What are clients telling you right now? I mean, obviously, equities have done quite well so far this year. It was supposed to be the year of the bond. We haven't quite seen that yet. And, and commodities are doing quite well as well, even the likes of Bitcoin. I mean, what, what are their preferences right now? What are the fund flows telling you? So I think um, for us, because of the risk of like, mindset of a lot of the retail clients, that's why you, we see a lot of like, um, assets being piling to cash or money market fund, like I said, right? So um, I'm trying to generalize um, um, some of the investment behavior here where um, in Asia, um, there's one secular theme, uh, which is income. People here, like, they love like, income product right? with dividend payout, with regular dividend payout. So I think this is the one trend that we have been seeing in different market cycles. And then, um, as I, I mentioned earlier on, um, I think uh, for those who want to have like, higher like, return, seeking higher return, they would be like, going to equities, going back to equities, and then India. I think India is a very obvious like, choice for uh, somebody investor, uh, um, not even on the equity side, even on the fixed income side. Mm -hmm. When you look at India, because of the JP Morgan, uh, the, the bond index inclusion of India government bond, right? So only after an announcement until uh, March, we have already seen um, around 8.8 .8 billion into the local like, Indian bond market. So you can see, right, the, the potential there. And then we have like large institutional clients already looking into like uh, allocating to um, India like fixed income as part of their um, like allocation. And I think over time, these large institutional clients, they would definitely look into beyond just like because of the index inclusion, right? They would put it as a strategic asset allocation. So we are envisage, uh, we try, we, we envisage the fact that like for India, for example, the fixed income market, um, we will see, for example, in the next three to five years, 100 billions of like, investment getting into India for the market. And of course, right, you guys can see it in, in the stock market where it has been performing very well. And I think the story will continue. So that is a very, very strong inflow um, as, as part of the investment like, like theme um, over the past like, 12 months. HSBC Asset Management's Daisy Ho and KKR's Kate Richdale, they're speaking with Avon Man in Hong Kong. And Bloomberg's New Voices is an initiative focused on amplifying the views of women in business and finance. And subscribers can see more from that launch event on the terminal and online. More ahead on Daybreak Australia, this is Bloomberg. Improving relations between Beijing and Canberra are brightening the outlook for Australian stocks that have faced trade restrictions. For more, let's bring our stocks and credit reporter Georgina McKay, who uh, has been looking at all this and obviously wine-related stocks, Treasury wine, we've already heard from them ahead of the key meeting uh, where I expected to see those tariffs being dropped. So have we seen those moves? Have they been sort of priced in largely already? Yeah, for sure. So since speculation sort of started mounting late last year, we've seen a jump in Treasury uh, shares. And on the day that the tariffs were scrapped, we saw another jump and we saw a jump in smaller company, Australian Vintage. Mm. So some of that is priced in and I think people were quite optimistic heading into this year anyway. There are questions around how much of an uplift we're going to see in the earnings of these companies. So prior to the levies, the China market was about 30% of Treasury's earnings. But since demand, since about 2019, demand is just about halved. So 
how quickly that's going to pick up once the consumer preference shifts back to wine will be really interesting. And another stock, uh, Aurora, a bottle maker, mm. Morgan Stanley's tipping a bit of an earnings lift for them um, as they have a glass product that can bottle some wine. And, and of course, it, no sector perhaps more exposed to the warming diplomatic relations is the commodities one. But what does this mean for the mineral sector in particular? So for the mineral sector, I think there probably are a few more questions. So over recent years, China has flagged that they would like to invest a little bit more in Australia in lithium. And they've they've tried to uh, invest in uh, the rare earth space as well. They Australia blocked a deal a, a last year for northern uh, minerals. So that was a bit of a test to the relations. But regardless really of the, the how the ties um, improve, Australia's critical minerals are extremely important for the world. And you've got Western governments, in, including the US, that are trying to invest in reserves here. And that is happening across lithium and that is happening across rare earths. And we had last year uh, mineral resources boss Chris Ellison say that there were concerns among Australian companies with partnering with Chinese firms, as we're already seeing through producers and refiners having joint ventures of money getting trapped in China. So perhaps with warming ties, that may alleviate some of those concerns, but how much investment comes into Australia is still unclear. All right, that was our Asia Stocks and Credit Reporter, Georgina McKay there. And taking a look as we head into the morning session so far, what's really standing out to us is the move in bonds in particular here today because yesterday or overnight, of course, following that hotter-than-expected US inflation print, it was a very swift repricing coming through. So traders now seeing the Fed waiting until after the Northern Hemisphere summer to cut as we saw yields, as I said, surging across the curve, but particularly at that front end and the 10-year hitting 4.5% for the first time in several months. So that's the outlook here. You see those yields moving higher. A quick check on Korean equities as we head into the open here today. And you are looking for a drop. It's that move on Wall Street. Plus, South Korea's president suffering a big loss in the parliamentary vote.